United Nations have bridged the English Channel. On June the 6th, 1944, a date imperishably written in the annals of history by the armed forces of the United Nations, the fighting men of America, Canada, and Britain embarked on the greatest amphibious operation ever undertaken. More than four years of preparation had borne fruit. D-Day, prelude to the deliverance of Europe, came at last. In the high spirits of free men launched on the greatest of all crusades, the trained soldiers of democracy left the shores of England. For those who had so long awaited the event, this was indeed the zero hour. For Winston Churchill, more than almost anyone else, as he boards invasion craft to bid Godspeed to Allied troops. On the coast of Normandy, Allied landings secured a bridgehead wide and deep. Supreme Commander Eisenhower made his long-awaited broadcast to the people of France. This was the hour for which oppressed millions had prayed. A landing was made this morning on the coast of France by troops of the Allied Expeditionary Force. This landing is but the opening phase of the campaign in Western Europe. Great battles lie ahead. I call upon all who love freedom to stand with us now. Keep your faith strong. Our arms are resolute. Together we shall achieve victory. Ladies and gentlemen, you've all heard the great news of our invasion, which is going where sure to lead us on to victory. And while wishing good luck and Godspeed to all of our forces, especially perhaps our own loved ones, let's get back to work just as soon as we possibly can, redouble our efforts to bring these boys back victoriously and just as speedily as possible. Thank you. Parliament was told that all had gone well, had gone at this early stage better than had been anticipated. The London public was elated at the news of progress. The Allies had landed in France. While it was still barely light, airfields all over England were astir. Paratroopers, their faces darkened to the color of chocolate, climbed aboard gliders and transport planes. More than a thousand such planes were used by this section of the invading force. American youngsters, grinning even on their way to battle. These men were part of the largest airborne operation in history. General Breton of the U.S. Army gives the good luck rabbit's foot to some of his men. From many airfields, the huge transports take off. Over the channel, there was heavy cloud. But even so, the great trifibious operation was underway. Sometimes through the gaps, the airborne spearhead saw something of the invasion armada. 4,000 ships and thousands of smaller craft were heading south. Channel Island of Jersey, occupied since Dunkirk, saw in the invasion of France the hour of its own deliverance. Day bombers blast coastal installations, continuing the heavy attacks of the night before. navies lay the responsibility of taking the armies across. Responsibility made easier by almost complete fighter cover. 2,000 tons of shells every 10 minutes smothered the German artillery. In the Italian theater, Rome, perhaps by coincidence, was captured only a few hours before D-Day dawned.
General Mark Clark enters the city and the first European capital is freed of Nazi tyranny. When the Russian summer offensive develops, as it is hourly expected to, Germany will be subjected to major attacks on three sides. The Russians, engaging the greater part of the German army for three whole years, recently under the leadership of Marshal Zhukov, have paved the way for the Western assault. When the landing craft came within sight of the Cherbourg Peninsula and the Seine Bay, every man on board knew that a tough fight lay ahead. The world learns with thankfulness that the early losses were far smaller than anticipated. To the 9th American Air Force belongs much of the credit for that merciful fact. Our bombers and fighters grounded almost the whole of the Luftwaffe. out. Largely owing to the success of this operation, in little more than 12 hours the Allied beachhead was 13 miles wide and 10 miles in depth. The men of this newest department of the Army are trained to act independently. With great effect they proceeded to carry out their general instructions to harass the enemy and destroy everything German in sight. The Supreme Commander and his lieutenants have every cause to be gratified by early progress. Eisenhower, Montgomery, and Tedder have set in motion the Second Front. The Supreme Commanders are optimistic. <laughs> 